As we come now to the preaching of the Word of God, we're going to return to our study of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, although admittedly, right now, we're using 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 as a launching pad, as a launching pad, because Paul, in these verses, in verses 13 through 18 of chapter 4, Paul encourages and he comforts believers with what lies ahead of them. He says, I I don't want you to be ignorant, rather, I want you to know about what is ahead of you, and Paul is encouraging them. But Paul encourages the Thessalonians about what will happen in the future based on what has already happened in the past. Because Christ has done these things in the past, therefore we have this hope for the future. And so what we have been doing in the past two sermons is focusing on what Christ has done in the past. Specifically, Paul says in verse 14, He says, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And we've been investigating what does that mean? Studying that phrase, what does it mean that Jesus died and rose again? And we've been developing over the past two sermons a line of argumentation. A line of argumentation that asserts that when Jesus Christ died, his soul, his human soul, descended to Sheol even to the abyss. And he descended there not to suffer, but to subdue Satan and uh, and his minions. And Jesus did not descend there to languish, but to liberate the righteous dead who were at rest in upper Sheol, as we have discussed. And Jesus did not descend there to remain, to be imprisoned or stuck there, but to rise again from the dead. And so we have said that Jesus Christ descended in triumph to hell or to Hades or to Sheol, and that he was raised from the dead in triumph. Last week, we put an illustration, a diagram up on the live stream to help you visualize what has been taught and what will be taught in this sermon and the next. And so I want to have that put, out, put on the live stream again You may have seen it in the flock note email that was sent out yesterday. I attached that image, that diagram, as an image in that email because it's basically a handout. If you were here, I would give it to you as a handout. And so we should have that on the live stream now, and you should be able to hear me while I briefly just describe it and walk you through it. Is it being showed right now? Okay, good. Very good. So you'll see a simple diagram with a a V shape that begins with glory and ends with session. And so let me just walk you through that briefly. This handout, it visualizes Christ's work in one continuous flow of first successive descending and then successive ascending. There's a descending and then an ascending. And so you begin with Christ's glory. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus speaks many times about the glory he had before he came into the world. So God the Son has eternal, everlasting glory with the Father. And that's the beginning point. And then Jesus many times talks about coming down from heaven. He is the one who comes down from heaven. And so the incarnation is a first descending from that glory which Christ had from before the foundation of the world and now descending into uh, the earth in incarnation. And so the incarnation is that first part of descending. And then, additionally, uh, Paul says that Christ humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so the crucifixion after the incarnation is a further humiliation. It's a further descending of Jesus Christ for us and our salvation. And so from glory, Christ descends to incarnation. He descends to crucifixion. And then Christ finally descends to Hades or to Sheol or to hell, as we say in English. But The descent to Hades, the descent to Sheol, is not further humiliation. It is a further descent for us on our behalf. It is a part of his work, but it is not humiliation. It is the turning point from descent to ascent. It is where Christ begins to manifest his triumph. 
because Christ rises from the dead, which means that his soul is reunited with a new and glorious body, or rather his body made new and made glorious. And so from Sheol, from Hades, his soul not being abandoned there, as the scriptures say, Christ rises from the dead. And then, having risen from the dead, then Christ ascends into heaven with his glorious body. And then finally, Christ sits down at the right hand of the Father or at the right hand of the majesty on high, as the writer to the Hebrews says. And that's what the word session means. In theology, Christ's session is his sitting down. If a, if a, a meeting is in session, everyone has sat down there They're involved in the meeting, and so Christ's session is his sitting down, which is a new high point in glory where Christ is exalted. His sitting down is an exaltation. And so this diagram visualizes one continuous descending and ascending pattern from glory to glory, the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for us and for our salvation. One thing that I added to this diagram that's a little bit different from last week is that the diagram also shows those three realms of existence that we talked about two sermons ago, heaven, earth, and under the earth, to use Paul and John's language. The top level, glory and session, is heaven. The middle level, incarnation and crucifixion and resurrection and ascension, those all take place on earth. And then the descent, of course, takes place under the earth, so to speak, or rather Sheol, Hades. And so we see Christ's work in heaven, earth, under the earth, in one continuous descending and ascending movement. The glory that Christ had with the Father before the the incarnation matches the glory he experiences at sitting down. And what does Jesus say in John chapter 17 just before he's about to finish his work in terms of going to the cross, he, he, he's praying to the Father and saying that he has completed his work, and he asks the Father to glorify him with the glory that he had before the world existed. And so Jesus is expecting when he gives up his life as, as a sacrifice, when he goes to the cross and dies, he expects glory to initiate from there and end in his session. And so everything fits according to the scriptural data. And you can also see in this, uh, in this diagram that the, the different levels are, are really parallels. So Christ's pre-incarnate glory matches his post-ascension, session glory. Those, they go together on that same level. We can see that the incarnation parallels the ascension. Christ descends from heaven to earth to take on our flesh in incarnation which parallels Christ ascending from earth to heaven in a new flesh, in a new and glorious flesh for us. And the crucifixion parallels the resurrection, one where the body is put to death, and the resurrection where a new body is brought to everlasting life. And so the descent to to Hades, or the, the, the descent to Sheol, doesn't have a parallel because it's the turning point. The descent is where that continuous descending is completed and the continuous ascending begins there in sheol and hades as we have said christ proclaims his victory on the cross he proclaims that what he proclaims what he has done and this shows to the wicked in sheol that their condemnation is just and he empties Abraham's bosom. Christ empties upper Sheol, and he leads a host of captives, first in resurrection, then ascension, and session, as they are united to him. Now think about this with me, and this is by way of introduction. This is running through what we've already discussed so that it's fresh in order to move forward. The resurrection of Christ from the dead I want you to think about this. Christ's resurrection, he's in Sheol, and then he's resurrected. This would have been a terrible defeat and a terrifying prospect for Satan and all the wicked angels and men. It would have been terrifying for them. Why? Because not only does it mean that Satan's power over death is taken away from him, but the most terrifying thing 
is that Christ would have announced to the wicked dead that as Jesus Christ is being raised from the dead, they too will be raised from the dead. But they will be raised not unto glory, but unto everlasting destruction. Jesus is proclaiming to them, they will now know by virtue of Christ's proclamation and resurrection, they will know that when he returns to the earth, he's going to raise them up too. And he's going to banish them forever and ever to the outer darkness, the unquenchable fire. That's the terminology that Jesus uses in his earthly ministry. Jesus says, I'm not done with you. I'm going to raise you up in new bodies for you. But you're going to have new bodies that will be fitted, that will be equipped for everlasting torment. And so when they see Jesus' resurrection, as he rises from the dead... As they see him leave in resurrection, what exactly does that look like? I can't explain it because Jesus' body is in earth and that's where it's reunited. So I'm not saying they're seeing Jesus' resurrected body, but they know that Jesus leaves Sheol for resurrection. As they become witnesses or as they become knowledgeable of Christ's resurrection, they know beyond any shadow of a doubt, Satan is defeated. They are justly condemned. And they're going to be raised up again in the future for everlasting torment. They're already in torment, but now they're going to have they're going to have new bodies that are fitted for torment in a in a way that they've never experienced and we can't even comprehend. Just as we talk about the incomprehensibility of the glory of the new body for us, there's an incomprehensibility of the inglorious body for the wicked. And they would have known that because of Christ's descent and his resurrection. So Christ's descent would have been such a proclamation of victory over Satan and all wicked men and angels. They now have an expectation, a certain expectation of cursed bodily eternal afterlife. The resurrection of Christ tells all of his people, you have a certain and assured hope of resurrection glory because of my resurrection. But for the wicked, it is a certain and assured uh, resurrection. What's the opposite of hope? Despair of eternal inglory, of eternal condemnation and suffering. And so that is how the descent becomes a hinge. Christ doesn't go there to do anything by way of atonement. His work of atonement was completed on the cross. He doesn't go there to suffer. He goes there to make a proclamation of victory and to leave with the righteous souls of the Old Testament saints, never for them to return. Now, ahead of us in our study of Christ's descent, and if the diagram is still on the screen, I, I should have asked for that to be taken down a little bit earlier, so we're, we're good. You've seen that, and it was in the email that was sent out to you. Ahead of us, there still remains uh, five main points, but as far as my plans go, we're going to give two sermons to those remaining five points. Uh, In this sermon, we're going to deal with two of those. Uh, And then in the next sermon, we'll deal with the third, fourth, and fifth point. So what's what's left? I'll tell you what those five are briefly, and then we'll get into the first two. Uh, First, we're going to develop three additional arguments for the descent. And then we're going to investigate the Old Testament background of the descent. So that will be this sermon three additional arguments, as well as the Old Testament background. And then next week, Lord willing, third, we'll consider some alternate perspectives at different points in the development of this doctrine. As I said, at almost every point, people take a slightly different path here and there, and we'll consider some of those. Fourth, uh, we'll look briefly at some historical perspective. Why has this doctrine been somewhat neglected in the churches of the Reformed heritage? And then fifthly, we'll conclude with personal and practical applications of the doctrine of the descent. So this sermon will focus on those first two main points. First, three additional arguments for the descent. Last week, we grounded, biblically, we grounded the descent in passages like Ephesians 9. The one who ascended is the one who descended into the lower parts of the earth. We looked at Acts chapter 2, where Peter uses Psalm 16, you will not, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. We took note of Romans chapter 10, 
verses 8 and 9, where Paul says that the righteousness of faith lays hold of the one who has descended for us into the abyss and has ascended for us into heaven. And so we, we could just stop there. We could conclude and say that's enough to affirm the doctrine of the descent. But I'd like to consider three additional arguments. Number one, we're going to look at statements of triumph connected with Christ's death. Statements of triumph connected with Christ's death. What I mean is, I want to look at Bible verses, passages of Scripture, that talk about by dying or through dying or through the process of what death is, Christ triumphed. Victory through death. So please turn with me first to 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, several weeks ago I, I mentioned the phrase, this is a place where an elephant may swim. And the writer I was referencing was talking about this passage, meaning it's very deep. It's very deep. But we will do our best to briefly look at it and conclude something from it, not looking at it in full detail. First Peter chapter 3, we're going to read verses 18 through 22. We looked at this briefly last week also. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. His suffering takes place on the cross, being put to death in the flesh. He dies on the cross to suffer, to make the righteous for the unrighteous. And then what happens? After Christ dies, his soul is separated from the body. That's what death is. He's made alive in the spirit. And so as a soul, as a human soul, as is normal for humans, he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. This is to Sheol itself. Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Now, verse 22 is what I want to focus on. There are many different, and if you've done any study on this passage, you'll know there, there are many different ideas of what these words mean, but we can take it, we can read it very naturally as a statement that Jesus Christ dies on the cross his soul descends to Sheol, where he makes a, vic a proclamation of victory to those who are imprisoned there. And then he's resurrected and ascends to God's right hand. And what is the result? Angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. And so I want you to note in verse 22 that when Christ reaches that full ascension, that session, that sitting down at the Father's right hand, Peter says that in the present, already, when Christ has sat down, angels, authorities, and powers have been, already in the present, subjected to Jesus Christ. And the point that I want us to, the point I want to make, and the thing I want us to note, is that Christ's victorious subduing of Satan happens through death, descent, resurrection, ascension, and session, Christ's session, his sitting down, being the final point in that process of ascending. And so the descent should be understood as the beginning of Christ's exaltation and the commencement of his victory. Next, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. And just to try and be as clear as possible, to repeat the point from 1 Peter chapter 3 as you turn to 1 Corinthians 15, the point is that through dying, descending, resurrecting, ascending, and sitting down, Jesus conquers and triumphs and subdues angels, authorities, and powers. And remember, when the scripture talks about angels and authorities and powers and such things, it's talking about spiritual beings. It's not talking about the kings of the earth. 
It's talking about the, the things that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, that we, we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against the, the rulers of this age. He's not talking about presidents and dictators. He's talking about uh, Satan and Satan's wicked angels that are demons. And by dying, descending, etc., Christ has subjected them. He has subdued them. Now look at verses 20 through 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Would like to spend more time in this chapter, but we don't have that time. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 27. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, that's Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. That, of course, is Christ. Well, <laughs> Paul explains it next verse. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign now until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For, this is quoting from the Old Testament, God has put all things in subjection under his feet. What I want us to note here again is a statement that because Christ has died and risen, he has already attained, he has already accomplished a victory. Now Paul makes it clear that the victory is not entirely complete, but it has commenced. Jesus has indeed already descended, already risen from the dead, ascended to the Father, and sat down at his right hand, and so God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Death has not yet been fully destroyed. He has not destroyed every rule and every authority and every power completely as at the end, and yet he has already subjected every authority under his feet. Well, how do we know that this victory has already commenced through Christ's death and resurrection? We could think about the previous two passages that we just looked at, uh, but we could also look at more. So turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. First Peter 3 says angels, authorities, and powers have been subjected to him. First Corinthians 15 says God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. The writer to the Hebrews is saying that Jesus partook of everything that is human, our flesh and blood, and our death, the death that all men experienced. And Jesus destroyed the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. He did not destroy Satan in the sense of removing him from existence, we know that, but in concert with 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Peter 3, God has put all things in subjection under his feet, including the one who has the power of death. The point being, Jesus through death has already triumphed, already conquered the one who has the power of death. And these passages, of course, fit so perfectly with what Jesus says in Revelation 1.18, which we've quoted every sermon. Jesus says, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. And commentators make, a, make something of that phrase, I have the keys of death and Hades. If you have my house keys, <laughs> how did you get them? <laughs> The only way to get someone's keys is to wrest them from them, to take them by force, to bind the strong man and to enter his home and take his possessions. So if Jesus has the keys of death in Hades, it's because he went to Hades and destroyed the one who has the power of death. And so these statements of death, victory, subjection, all of these fit perfectly with the doctrine of the descent. One more passage and then we'll wrap this up. 
Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. Colossians 2. Colossians 2, 11 through 15. <clears throat> In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So the context of Christ dying and raising again, us participating in his death and resurrection, picking up verse 13, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Verse 15 is what I want to focus on. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now again, rulers and authorities are not presidents and kings on the earth, but rather Satan and the wicked angels. And Paul says that they were disarmed and put to open shame and triumphed over through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Now, I want to be clear about something here, whether it's 1 Peter 3 or 1 Corinthians 15 or Colossians chapter 2 or Revelation 1:18. All these verses that we've looked at, they do not necessarily explicitly state the descent. That's not what I'm arguing. However, what we do see is that in death and resurrection, Christ conquers and triumphs over Satan and his demons. And so if we read these statements of triumph death, these death triumph statements, and we connect them with passages like Ephesians 4.9, which does affirm the descent, Romans 10.8, which affirms the descent. Psalm 16, used by Peter in Acts 2, which affirms the descent. When we put these passages together, they fit perfectly as statements of victory through death, death being descent to Hades. There's another thing that I want to be clear about, and that is that the doctrine of the descent does not in any way take the place of the cross as the location of Christ's decisive victory blow. Because the cross is where atonement happens. The descent is not an atoning act. So when we refer to the descent as triumph and victory, it is not in any way detracting from or diminishing the cross. But also, there's no reason to, to, to dissect and split up Christ's work. It's one continuous work for us and for our salvation. And the cross is where atonement happens. It's because Christ pours out his life as a sacrifice on the cross. It's because of that that he is raised up from the dead. And it is because of that that all the righteous dead are cleansed forever. It is because of that that our sins are forgiven. And so this does not change in any way our view of the cross. Rather, what we are doing here is giving the descent its appropriate place within the fullness of the work of Christ as that hinge, as that final descent, beginning also that ascent. From Christ's incarnation to his crucifixion to his descent to his resurrection to his ascension to his session, all of these things combine as Christ's humiliation and exaltation for us and for our salvation. And so these statements of victory connected with death are not in any way changing or detracting from the cross as the place where Christ triumphs by offering a sacrificial death that it's done, it is finished. There's no claim now on the righteous. Rather, we are giving the descent its place within the decrescendo and crescendo of Christ's victorious work of redemption for us. So we should read statements connecting uh, Christ's triumph and death not merely as referring to the cross, but the cross together with the descent, which immediately follows 
from the cross. Because again, this is the question that few people actually ask. What happened between the cross and the resurrection? And that is what we are trying to do, to give the proper place to the descent within the work of Christ, without changing or modifying or altering everything else that we understand about Christ's work. And so because of this, we can say with the saints and angels in Revelation 5.12, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. We spent much more time on that first additional argument for the descent than we will on the next two. The next two will be brief. So remember, our main point is three additional arguments for the descent. The first one is looking at statements of Christ's victory through death. The second one is that Jesus had not yet ascended. Jesus had not yet ascended. What am I referring to? In John chapter 20 and verse 17, Mary Magdalene sees the resurrected Lord in the garden outside his tomb. And Jesus says to Mary, he says, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now my only concern with this verse right now is to take note that Jesus states that he has not yet ascended to to the Father. Now, everyone could agree that this means that Christ in his resurrected body has not yet ascended to heaven. Of course, that is obvious. But it makes even more sense if there is a progressive ascent from hell to earth in resurrection and then in a resurrected body from earth to heaven. It fits the descent perfectly fits the flow of descending and ascending in one progressive move. If Christ's soul ascended to heaven between his death and his resurrection, it seems a little bit strange that Jesus would say, I have not yet ascended to my father, meaning just his body, but rather read in the context of the descent, Christ has not not yet ascended to the father in soul or in body. It's a supplemental argument. It's not a definitive argument, but it's an interesting statement from Jesus, that he says, I have not yet ascended to the Father. Thirdly, the third supplemental or additional argument for the descent. Number three is the expectations of the devil and the demons. The expectations of the devil and demons. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul talks about how when he came to the Corinthians, he resolved to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. And I want to read a very interesting statement from Paul about the expectations of Satan and the demons. Now, before we read that, I need you to have in your mind the fact, the truth, that Satan and his demons were very much involved in orchestrating, in bringing about Christ's crucifixion. Satan wanted Jesus to be put to death. How do we know that? There's many reasons, but... Who entered Judas to go and betray Jesus to the authorities so that they could find him and get him and capture him and then put him to death? Satan entered Judas. Satan was working to get Jesus killed. Satan wanted to murder Jesus to to kill him. Why Why would he do that? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. And remember, Paul says, I resolve to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. And then Paul says, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. And then he says, none of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, when Paul talks about the rulers of this age, he's not talking about Herod or Pilate or chief priests or the Sanhedrin. 
He's talking about Satan and the demons. The context being, as Paul reflects on God's master plan, and as God preaches the cross, Christ crucified, Paul says, Paul teaches everywhere, the cross was not an accident. The cross was the plan from the very beginning. And Jesus himself said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. And so Satan and the demons, they think they're accomplishing one thing by bringing Jesus to the cross. When God, the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, God is accomplishing God's purposes through the cross. And Paul is saying if Satan had understood God's purposes, Satan would not have driven Jesus to the cross if he knew that that's what God's purpose was all along. Now how does that in any way relate to or touch on the doctrine of the descent? Well, if we, if we take our understanding, the understanding that I've been teaching of heaven, earth, under the earth, where souls go, where souls go when, when they die before Christ's resurrection, etc. If, if we have all those things in place, what would Satan's, Satan and the demons' expectations have been uh, by killing the Messiah, by killing the Christ? They would have expected the Christ's soul to descend to Sheol and be stuck there, to remain there, because that's what happens to humans, even the righteous ones. They may be at rest in Sheol, they may not be punished or, or tormented there, but they're there, their souls, their souls in Sheol. And that was Satan's power over mankind, which Paul calls the power of death. Satan, by tempting man to sin and the curse of sin coming upon man, Satan had brought about a state of affairs where mankind must exist with an imperfect afterlife. Men die and now they're separated souls from bodies and they they live after death with an incomplete, broken, imperfect existence. Satan has souls in Sheol, yes, separated, righteous, and wicked, but the souls are there. And Satan has power over this. Death separates the soul from the body. The souls remained in Sheol. Yes, separated. And so Satan thinks, if I can just kill the Christ, if I can just bring his soul to Sheol, he'll be there and then, and then we're done. He can't do anything more. Well, what happens? First, Christ lays down his life. No one takes it from him. And then, second... So that's what Satan sees happening. I'm going to murder the Christ. I'll have his soul. What happens? Christ gives up his spirit. He gives up his life. And so first, Christ lays down his life. Second, Christ lays down his life as a ransom. That was not expected by Satan. Satan leads the sheep to the slaughter, and Christ was silent. Christ gave his back to those who beat him, and Christ poured out his life as an offering. So Christ lays down his life. Satan doesn't doesn't take it from him. Christ lays down his life as a ransom. That was not, Satan was not trying to offer a sacrifice on the cross. Priests bring animals to offer sacrifices. Satan brings the sheep to the cross and doesn't realize this is an altar. And third, after Christ gives up his life and gives up his life as a ransom, Because he's given up his life as a ransom, third, God raises him from the dead, does not abandon his soul to Sheol, but resurrects him, lifts him up, and exalts him. Satan doesn't realize that he was just offering up a sacrifice. And so by bringing the Christ's soul down to Sheol, Satan in no way accomplished what he had understood. The mystery hidden for ages that Paul says is now unveiled, the rulers of this age did not understand it. Satan expected victory for himself through the cross. If I can just put this man to death, then I will have him. And yet God accomplishes victory through the cross. Because the strong man must first be bound before his goods can be plundered. And the strong man invited Christ into his house. What a reversal. So Paul is right. That if the rulers of this age had understood God's purposes in Christ, they never, never would have crucified the Christ. They would have made the Jews love Jesus and be so nice to Jesus and take care of Jesus and and all these things. They never would have pushed the Jews and entered Judas to bring about the death of Jesus Christ. 
This relates to the descent in that it fits with an understanding of the pre-resurrection death or the understanding of pre-resurrection death that all souls descended to Sheol. If from the beginning the souls of the saints were in heaven, Satan would have no reason to expect Christ's soul to descend to Sheol because Satan would know righteous souls don't come down to Sheol. Satan knew Christ was righteous. He tempted him himself, and Jesus wouldn't give in to temptation. Satan knows Jesus is a righteous soul. Satan wants to kill him. What does that indicate about Satan's expectations? He's not a foolish or stupid creature. Satan tempted Jesus, knew he was righteous, and yet still expected Jesus' death to be to his own advantage. Does this, does Paul's statement about the rulers of this age not understanding what God was accomplishing in the crucifixion, does this prove definitively the descent? No, but the descent provides a very good answer to the question of what did Satan expect and what did they not understand? Well, we've completed the first point. We've looked at three supplemental arguments for the descent of Christ. And now I want to finish with our second main point, the Old Testament background for the descent. The Old Testament background for the descent. As you've heard from me and as you've seen in the diagram, the doctrine of the descent is a significant feature of Christ's work. It has its own place. It doesn't take over anything else. It doesn't change anything else. It just takes its own place within the work of Jesus Christ. And if that's the case, if the descent truly has a place in the work of Christ our mediator, then we should expect to find an Old Testament background for it. Because Jesus said to the disciples on the road to Emmaus that, the, that Moses and the prophets predicted the sufferings and glories of the Christ. So if you read Moses and the prophets, you should see the sufferings and glories of the Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 5, Moses wrote of me. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1 that the prophets predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. And Paul says in Acts chapter 17, well, the, the, the narrative says that Paul was explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead. Where is Paul explaining that from? The Old Testament. As we just read in 2 Timothy 3 today, the sacred writings, the scriptures, were breathed out by God. Paul's thinking of the Old Testament, most specifically in those statements. We should be able to find in the Law and the Prophets in the Old Testament the sufferings and glories of the Messiah, of the Christ. And if something as significant as Christ's descent to Sheol or Hades is true, then it should have an Old Testament background. Let's consider first three passages that describe the sufferings and expectations of the Messiah. Turn with me to Psalm 16. First, we're going to look at passages that describe the sufferings and glories of the Messiah. And then we're going to look at passages that deal with um, the Messiah's self-conscious expectations. What did the Messiah expect? Look at Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, as our time is rapidly running away from me. This was quoted by Peter in Acts chapter 2. I have set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, we won't spend time on this text because we looked at it last week, but just note again that the Christ's body is put to death and his soul is in Sheol, but not abandoned there. As Peter says, Christ has risen from the dead. So Psalm 16 is an Old Testament background. The soul of the Holy One in Sheol, not abandoned there, but brought to glory. 
Let's move on to Psalm 30. You can turn over to Psalm 30, verses 1 through 3. And listen to these words through the lens of the crucifixion, the descent, and the resurrection from the dead. Psalm 30, verses 1 through 3. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. David is thanking God for preserving his life from death. David is saying, you didn't let me die. And by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he is predicting. He is predicting the experience of the Christ who truly does die. But his soul and his soul truly descends to Sheol, but it is brought up and restored to life and everlasting joy. You restored me to life. And so Psalm 30, just like Psalm 16, describes the Messiah whose soul descends to Sheol in death and is lifted up, is resurrected from the pit, from the dead. Now turn with me to Psalm 69. This whole psalm is full of predictions of Christ's crucifixion and death. Jesus quotes this on the cross not the verses that we're going to read, but he he uses this psalm. Look at verses 13 through 18. It says, But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. At an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters, the abyss. Let not the flood sweep over me, or the deep, the abyss, swallow me up, or the pit, Close its mouth over me, the deep in the pit. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to my soul. Redeem me. Ransom me because of my enemies. You hear the Messiah calling out to God to raise him up, to not allow his soul to stay in the deep and in the pit. Redeem me and ransom me. And so Psalm 30 and Psalm 69 fit perfectly with Psalm 16 because in Psalm 16, God promises to the Holy One, I will not abandon your soul to Sheol. And in Psalm 30 and 69, there is a plea and a thankfulness. In Psalm 69, redeem my soul from the pit. In Psalm 30, thank you, you have redeemed my soul from the pit. And so the Messiah can appeal to these promises because they've already been made to him. God has promised me he will not abandon my soul to Sheol. So this gives us a very strong Old Testament background for the descent. But I want to conclude with three more passages that foreshadow Christ's victorious death and descent and resurrection. And these passages are going to foreshadow Christ's death, descent, and resurrection through the imagery of victory in battle and return from exile. So first, please turn with me to Psalm 107. We shouldn't be surprised at a strong Old Testament background for the descent because we used Acts chapter 2, Ephesians 4, 9, and Romans 10, and all to to ground the descent biblically, and each of those quotes from the Old Testament. Psalm 107. This is a psalm about Jews returning from exile in Babylon. They've been exiled to, to Babylon. They're returning from exile. Verses 13 to 16. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. This is very important language. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. Iron. 
Now, the language of gates and bars is ancient world language for strongholds and fortresses and prisons. A village has no walls. A city has walls, and the gates have bars. Uh, If your city has gates and bars, it is the strongest possible thing that you can build apart from carving out of a rock, a fortress. They describe the strongest places of protection or of imprisonment. And the language of the exile or the language of the return from exile is God bringing us out of darkness, God bringing us out of death, bursting our bonds and shattering the doors of bronze and the bars of iron because bronze and iron were the strongest metals known at that time, the strongest available to them. And Sheol is described elsewhere throughout the Old Testament as a place where everyone goes, no one returns, and it has bars and gates. The bars and gates are used to describe the place from which no one can get out. And we hear, here we see that return from exile is described as the opening of the inescapable prison of death. And this is a vision of Christ's descent, resurrection, and ascension. Secondly, turn to Isaiah 45. In Isaiah, there is a a parallel, more like an antithesis, where the king of Babylon is said to be exalted. He exalts himself to the heavens, and so he's going to be abased. He's going to be brought down to the lowest of lows, which is a metaphor for Satan. It's speaking of the true king of Babylon, but it also is describing Satan. And later in Isaiah, Cyrus, king of Persia, is used as a type, as a, a foreshadowing, of Jesus Christ, because the king of Babylon is the one who imprisons God's people, and Cyrus is the one who releases God's people from exile and imprisonment. And so we're going to see here, in the language of Cyrus releasing the exiles, Jesus Christ foreshadowed. Look at verses 1 through 4 of Isaiah 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belt of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I call you by your name, I name you, though you do not know me. Now, who's the anointed one? Well, in this case, it is Cyrus. Cyrus is anointed for a specific purpose. He, he is, God works through Cyrus to release the Judean exiles back to Jerusalem. But of course, this is foreshadowing. This is a type of Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. And what does he do? He breaks in pieces the doors of bronze and cuts through the bars of iron and plunders the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places, which is Sheol. Jesus is the one who plunders the strong man, and the bars and gates of hell did not prevail against him. Thirdly and lastly, turn to Psalm 68 as we draw to a close. Psalm 68. This is the psalm that Paul quotes in Ephesians chapter 4, the passage we've looked at many times. And what does Psalm 68 describe? Psalm 68 describes God as Israel's king fighting on behalf of Israel and bringing a host of captives back to Jerusalem in glorious procession. God will fight on our behalf and bring a host of captives back to our city. And in this psalm, as well as in the Old Testament, Bashan, a mountain, and Zion, another mountain, are pitted against each other as another antithesis. Bashan representing the wicked mountain and Zion representing the holy mountain of God. Let's pick up in verse 15. O mountain of God, on the one hand, Mountain of Bashan, on the other hand, 
O many peaked mountain, mountain of Bashan. So two mountains. Why do you look with hatred, O many peaked mountain, that's Bashan, at the mount that God desired for his abode, yes, where the Lord will dwell forever? So you have an exalted mountain looking with hatred on another exalted mountain. Verse 17, the chariots of God are twice 10,000, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation, and to God the Lord belong deliverances from death. But God will strike the heads of his enemies, the hairy crown of him who walks in his guilty ways. The Lord said, I will bring them back from Bashan. I will bring them back from the depths of the sea, that you may strike your feet in their blood, that the tongues of your dogs may have their portion from the foe. Your procession is seen, O God, the procession of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. The singers in front, the musicians last, between them virgins playing tambourines. Bless God and the great congregation, the Lord, O you who are of Israel's fountain. What what does this portray to us? Verse 18 says, Paul takes verse 18. And he says that the one who descended to the lower regions of the earth is the one who ascended, leading a host of captives. And we see see here that God the king goes and defeats the mountain of Bashan, and he delivers his people. He brings them back from the depths of the sea, leading a host of captives. Those who were exiled are being brought back into the holy city in a procession of glory into the sanctuary of the temple. So, brothers and sisters, when the Old Testament predicts the sufferings and subsequent glories of the Christ, what does it portray to us? It portrays the Christ dying and his soul being raised from Sheol. But it tells us that his time in Sheol is not a time of suffering and darkness. To the contrary, it is where the Messiah goes in victory and power to bring a host of captives out of darkness and imprisonment. And in resurrection, ascension, and session, Jesus Christ opens heaven for all who call on his name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So is there an Old Testament background for the descent specifically as having its place in the work of Christ? Absolutely. Paul uses it in Ephesians 4 and Romans 10. Peter uses it in Acts chapter 2. And we have looked at additional verses as well. Well, we're going to end here. I already have practical and personal applications in view at the end of next week's sermon, reflecting really on the past several weeks. So let me just give you three things by way of conclusion, but I'm just really going to tell them to you and not explain them. How should you respond to these these additional arguments for the descent and the Old Testament background of Christ's victorious deliverance of us, uh, for us and our salvation? Three things, you can write this down. Pause, praise, and persevere. We should pause and and think about these things. The psalmist, it's David, but it's also Christ. The psalmist is thanking the Lord and praising the Lord. The call to worship this morning was from Psalm 107, which we read a portion of, and it begins, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. If we pause and think about what Jesus has done for us and our salvation, it will lead us to secondly praise, to praise him for what he has done. And then thirdly, it will lead us to persevere and press on. And and we'll get back to that in next week's sermon. But persevere in the sense that Jesus has already prevailed. What we need to do is be faithful here in this life, in this body. Press on. 
and finish the race well. What is at the end of that race? Our sister Leah Hedstrom just completed that race. The end of it is glory. Christ suffered and entered into glory. We too suffer and enter into glory. What are our sufferings in comparison to his? This is a call to perseverance. So let us pause and praise and persevere. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have rescued us from the depths of the sea, from the pit. How we thank you that because you did not abandon Christ's soul to Sheol, neither will you abandon ours. In fact, we will never see it. How we thank you that in Christ's victorious resurrection and ascension and session, we being united to him, we have risen, we have ascended, and we have sat down. We thank you that death for us is a deliverance. It is a homecoming. It is being with you. And we thank you that you have given, to all, given us all these things freely, freely in Jesus Christ. Look at what he has done, and look at what we have done. We praise you. We give thanks to you, O God, our Father. We give thanks to you, and we praise you, God the Son. We give thanks to you and praise you, God the Holy Spirit. And we ask that you would help us to pause and ponder what you have done for us, to praise you all our days, and to persevere faithfully because of what you have done for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name.